Welcome to another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. I'm your host, Mike Moore. Could not be more excited about today's guest, Mr. Stephen Sheeler, CEO of Omniscient Neurotechnology. Stephen, how are you doing today? Great, Mike. Great to be here and great to see you. I hope everyone's doing good. Welcome to the show and uh, welcome from beautiful Sydney, Australia. I'm in Sydney. You're in LA. Uh, you know, we span the world doing what we're doing. It's great to connect and uh, I'll be in LA in a few weeks. So maybe we'll catch up in person when I'm there. That'd be fantastic. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Now I've been to Sydney and it's, uh, it's one of my favorite cities. My wife, prior to uh, uh, wrangling kids for a living, she was, uh, she was in fashion and she promptly educated me that Sydney is, is now uh, probably the most fashionable fashionable place in the, on the planet. So, uh, which, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have initially thought that, but Hey, it's, well, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It, I'm not contributing to that in any way. That's for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Hey, I'm going to, uh, you're certainly a man that needs no introduction, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a hack at it here and, uh, hopefully I'll do you, do you justice. Uh, Stephen was formerly the CEO of Facebook in Australia and New Zealand. Some funny uh, topics to talk about about that, but and drove Facebook Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and I think there was one other uh, technology you were involved with there. But uh, drove those to a, a top market worldwide, actually for for Facebook. He was the oldest person hired at Facebook at a at the ripe young age of 46 years old, where the average age was 25 years old, uh, then left and started a uh, strategic advisory firm, the Digital CEO, uh, where he was uh, partnered with global uh, uh, as a global senior advisor for McKinsey as well. So you've, uh, you've done a, a, a lot of different things as of late, but most recently you took over as a CEO of Omniscient Technologies. That's what brings us to today, you've come a long way from being a snow shoveler, a baker, a house painter, a donut fryer, taxi driver, carnival barker, and all the other, uh, what was it, 21 or 22 jobs that you listed uh, in your TED Talk that you gave in 2018 in Sydney, which was amazing. Uh, but no, I, I really, Stephen, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on to the show. I got a lot to get into with you in, a, in you know what is a relatively short period of time. I'd like to to lead into the conversation with a quote uh, for, uh, of yours that you said. Uh, I believe it was back in 2021. If I remember correctly, it was with an interview with David Coach from NEC. But uh, but you said no matter what the industry you are in, you are not immune from disruption. It, if it hasn't happened yet, they are coming for you, and. Uh, when I when I heard when I heard that it struck me as as really uh, interesting because I you know this 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 space that we're in of healthcare you know healthcare and and, and finance are are really the last the most regulated and and shall we say the last to be disrupted so I I thought it was a nice segue to to kind of have you tell me and 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 the viewers out there how did you get involved in this coming from Facebook a totally, totally unregulated space. How did you get involved in Omniscient? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, and I'll give you a little context on who I am as well. Just I'm actually American. I'm not Australian, even though our business is kind of founded in Australia. And the two other founders, there's three of us, uh, are also, one's American, one's from Belgium. So we just happen to live in Australia. Life has brought us here. But we're a very international global company. Our biggest markets are overseas. Australia, we don't have much of a, a presence in. We just have... A few of us live here. We're a COVID baby as well. We were born during the pandemic. We hired about 120 people around the world, all during COVID times. They don't even have an office. We're very virtual, right? That's the yeah. way businesses are built today. So it's kind of irrelevant where we are physically located. What matters is you know what we do. And your question about like how did I wind up here? Um, I was at my original uh, background. Uh, if I go way back, I was actually a musician a long time ago. I was a classical pianist and uh, violinist. And I was really, you know, I, I wanted to be an artist, a, a, you know, a musician. I wanted to be a classical musician. And I, I discovered that I didn't have enough talent when I was a teenager. I kind of got to um, a certain level and then I, I, I worked really hard at it, but I just wasn't talented enough. So I wound up not doing that um, and pretty much moving in a direction where I just learned whatever I could learn. I, I, I wound up getting a degree in uh, East Asian history. I lived in China, Japan, lived all over the world and just I was very lucky in my 20s, it was before the internet, and I got to travel the world 
back back in the days when you know the world was a little more uh, unknown. So it was a lot of fun. I spent about almost 10 years just kind of traveling around the world, doing things and living in different countries. By the time I got to my about 30, I thought, well, maybe I need to get a real job. So I went and got an MBA, which kind of delayed the decision for a couple of years. And I came out of there and the only people who hire me were um, management consulting firms. So I got a job as a management consultant. They you know, hire smart, smart people who don't have necessarily great backgrounds. And I didn't have a very rich CV, but I, I was reasonably smart. So that was kind of my, uh, you know, suddenly I was in front of boards and CEOs telling them what to do about their business. And, you know, I was, right. I, really, <laughs> I really didn't know what I was talking about, right? But, you know, you fake it till you make it. And I did that for a number of years and I left consulting and I did, but I did the same kind of work, a kind of strategy consulting work for some big companies. But along the way, the internet started to happen. And um, I started to get more and more interested in technology and big corporates in those days you know, technology was sort of mainframes and ERP systems and stuff. And it was, you had a CIO that handled that. But then there was this new stuff coming out, you know, apps and the iPhone and the internet and e-commerce that really wasn't being handled by the CIO. It just had no home within a lot of corporates. And I was, I, in, in the roles I was in, I, I found I could sort of grab that stuff and make it my own. So I started to fiddle around with things like e-commerce or apps in my role as sort of head of strategy, business development for some big companies. That got me so interested, I, I wound up leaving a couple of those jobs and went off and did my own stuff. I started a few companies on the side. I did some startups all the way back, you know, over 20 years ago, back in the age of the, the first dot-com bust. I remember I had a startup yeah. in those days and kind of went through that whole wave. So I learned a lot. I bounced between startup and kind of corporate life. Um, corporate gives you a paycheck. Startup's a lot more fun. And then I found myself at Facebook uh, a few years ago. Facebook approached me around the time of the IPO, and they were looking for people to build their Asia Pacific business, which was very small in those days. Uh, so I came on board to essentially build the business side of Facebook in this half of the world. And so we grew that from nothing to a multi-billion dollar company. And you know, a few years, you saw the hyper growth of Facebook. So, so I was a, I was a, a part of that, a reasonably big part of it. I was one yeah. of the senior guys at Facebook on the on the business side of the business, but there's a lot of other great people there as well. You know, we had a great team, great technology. And as you mentioned about uh, regulation, we were out ahead of regulation in many ways. I mean, Facebook benefited from the, the fact it was going to un, into unregulated space. That's changing as we know now, the, the hand of regulation yeah. is coming for social media. And then after a number of years at Facebook, where I was very proud of the work that I'd done, I, I thought I wasn't challenged enough anymore. We'd gone from pretty much nothing to thousands and thousands of employees and billions of dollars in revenue. And it just, it was, it wasn't as exciting for me anymore. So I left Facebook to look and think about doing other things. And I put my, I put my interest and my time into a, a bunch of things. I'm like a mini Elon Musk. I have a few different companies. I kind of have a, an involvement in a very mini Elon Musk, but <laughs> the one that really captured my imagination was one, the one we're talking about omniscient neurotechnology. And omniscient means all knowing for those of you who don't know, it's like, uh, you know, omni and, and, and shint is like a c consciousness or uh, prescience. It's uh, it's, right. it's all knowing. And the reason it's called all knowing is what we do is we map the human brain. We use machine learning and AI to build maps of the brain. So it's kind of the, it's the application of the technologies that Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple have developed over the years, the algorithms, the machine learning, the AI, but now we're applying it to the data of the human brain and your brain. Mike is just a big data processor. That's really all it is. And so it's only been recently in the past sort of five, seven years that we've gotten to an inflection point where the algorithms and the computing power are good enough to make sense to, to, of, the, of the information in your brain. So we're building on work of others, but we now build these maps. It's a field that's called connectomics. Genomics is the yep. mapping of the human genome. Connectomics is the mapping of the human brain. And we're probably the leaders in our field today in this new emerging space. Yeah. How, and how did you get? How did you get connected in with in, 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 into this? Uh, you know, uh, I know it's is it Michael Chagru and and is it Stephen or Stefan? Stefan. Stefan Doyen. Correct. Yeah. Did how did you get connected with these guys and their and, and the the idea that they had? Fascinating, and and you know, you know, and you look, it's always it always takes a village. It takes a team to make things happen. And the truth is. I know a bit about neuroscience. I know a bit about data science, but um, you know, I, I'm not the genius on those sides of the equation. In our business, we've got uh, uh, Mike Chagru. Mike's a neurosurgeon, and he was originally, he's got a fascinating story unto himself. He's actually from Oklahoma, of all places, 
Uh, I'm from <laughs> Buffalo, New York, you know, so we're kind of, you know, middle America kind of guys. And, but he was a super smart kid. He wound up going off to um, university, he went to University of Oklahoma, he did a degree in English. But then he was like, well, what am I going to do now? Um, he went to Columbia and he went to Columbia Med School, a guy with no pre-med background. He graduated top of his class from Columbia Med. Mike's pretty smart. He then went on to train as a brain surgeon at the University of California, San Francisco, which is the world's leading neurosurgical training. I was going to say that they're either one or two. Yeah. Correct. So, and Mike was top of his class there. So he came out probably the most talented neurosurgeon, one of the most talented neurosurgeons in the world. And he built a practice. He went back to Oklahoma and built a practice there at the University of Oklahoma that was probably the busiest neurosurgical center in America. Mike is a machine. He doesn't sleep. He, you know, he's one of those guys that I worked with Mark Zuckerberg for years and Mike is in the same category as, as Mark. It's, it's, you know, kind of a translational genius. Wow. And he got frustrated. He was a neurosurgeon who was getting frustrated because he was, he, he, you know, if you're, an, if you've ever seen a brain surgery and some of us have, I've seen a lot, your, your brain I've is just a lot of mush. As well. Yeah. It's just a lot, just a lot of mush in there. There's, it's hard to tell. What are you taking out? It's not like when you break your arm and you can see the, where the break is with an X-ray. There's no X-ray that necessarily shows you clearly how the brain is functioning. It's all about function. It's not about structure. And the challenge for a, a neurosurgeon is they're going to take pieces of that brain out. They're going to resect that brain. They're going to cut through things and they don't know what they're cutting through. And so Mike was very frustrated by this. He would have, you know, he'd have patients where he'd remove a tumor and then he wouldn't understand what they call them deficits. He wouldn't understand the deficits that, that person had, why they, why they were a zombie, why they couldn't, didn't recognize their wife why they couldn't walk when, when he thought that he had done everything correctly in the surgery. And he right. started to realize that there was a field called connectomics, which was this using machine learning to map the brain, to map the networks of the brain. So he, he actually went off and started to build his own um, first prototypes of that. He learned how to code in Python and machine learning. Are and you kidding relatively... me? I mean, that is unbelievable. This is... He's that kind of guy. And so that was relatively crude. But that's the one side of the story. And then meanwhile, in another part of the world, this guy named Stefan Doyen, our other co-founder, he's, he's got a PhD in neuroscience um, and he studied at Cambridge. He's a Belgian guy originally, a European guy. Well, he got frustrated by the same thing. He was in neuroscience. He was trying to help people with mental illness and, and dementia and neurological disorders get better. And he realized we don't understand what's going on inside their brain. We really don't get it. And so he left that field and went off and became an AI machine learning expert and wound up working for a big consulting firm running their whole machine learning and AI and data analytics practice. He, had, he left neuroscience behind. And then about three years ago, just through happenstance, those two guys met and they discovered that they had both been frustrated by the same problem around the same time. And they both were now starting to look to how do I use data and, and, and AI to solve this problem? And Mike showed Stefan the work he'd been doing. And Stefan said, I think I can make this a lot better. And I happen to have a PhD in neuroscience myself. So you don't have to explain what the brain is to me. Anyway, that was a marriage that was like Lennon meets McCartney. And, uh, and then I turned up around the same time, just a friend introduced us. And I know a lot of people, but as soon as I met these two guys, I was like, I was, They're smart. I, was yeah. <laughs> I was fascinated because this, they, they told me, they said, this changes everything. This changes our understanding of the human brain so fundamentally that it's going to unlock all kinds of human potential over the next you know, hundred years. And when you have people of this caliber tell you those things, you, you take pause. And so we started to talk about how we could maybe work together. I started helping them figure out their business model. I went to China to talk to some of the researchers that they were already working with in that market. And I got more and more fascinated and just saw the potential of what we were trying to build. So I, I kind of I, I kind of got more and more involved, and now it's pretty much you know, 100 percent of what I do today. I've got I do have a neurosurgery background. I, in a prior life, I used to sell medical devices and 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 spent quite a bit of time in, in neurosurgery. And you know, up until very very recently, this is the last frontier. Neuro is really it is. The, the it's the last frontier in medicine where they still understand very little about in the big scheme of things about about how things are inter, you know, interrelated and, and cause and, and effect. And um, so when I started doing some research on this stuff, uh, as I had mentioned to you before we even started filming, um, you know, th th this technology, I, I, I've, I've been watching it for a while now, and it's, it's pretty fascinating uh, what you guys are capable of doing. I'm more in, even interested in hearing about 
what we're, what, what what you do with with that inf- information, right? Because it's always about the utility. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. With AI, there's a ton of data and, and information out there, but now we're starting to see, okay, now we've got this stuff. What do we do with it? Which is, I'm excited to get, get into a little bit with you. That was, you know, one of the, one of the things I was going to have you do was, was really explain what Connectomics was, because that seems like it's, it's really the bedrock of kind of what you guys are doing. I don't, if I understand it correctly, Stephen, you guys didn't coin the phrase Connectomics, but you guys are bringing it to the forefront as as kind of the the foundation of hey this is really how we we think we can map this thing correct correct it's sort of um and it's funny mike when i when i meet a journalist um you know, we've had some journalists cover us i i often say remember the mo- this moment the first time you heard the term connectomics because i think mm-hmm. when the 21st century is done and they write the history of the century and the history of you know, human development, I think there'll be a chapter on connectomics. So we, you know, there'll be a chapter on genomics and a chapter on the metaverse, maybe. Personalized medicine or whatever. Yeah. Social media. Yeah. There'll definitely be a, a chapter on connectomics. And the reason for that is what, what it does is it tries to make sense of your brain as a network and as a network of networks. And it's kind of like, just think about your house for a minute, you know, and or the building that you're in. There's wiring everywhere behind those walls, right? So, right. you know, it's why the light works above you. It's why the computer has electricity. It's plugged into the wall. Um, it's why your fridge is running. And, you know, if you suddenly notice that, oh, the power goes out or that light doesn't work, what do you do? Well, you might check the bulb, but then you replace the bulb, but it still doesn't work. Then you say, oh, there's some sort of problem in the wiring. And so you go check the fuse box. Maybe that's okay. And then you say, hmm, okay, I don't understand what's going on. What's, what's the problem? So what, what would you do? You, well, if you're an electrician or if you go to an electrician, they'd bring out, here's the here's the wiring diagram of the building. Let's understand where the wires are. So let's not take a sledgehammer and start knocking down the walls and trying to find the wire, <laughs> right? Let's find where the wires are. Well, we can go and have a look. Oh, maybe a rat was eating through it or it's got some water damage or you know something. And we replaced, we fixed the wiring. Well, your brain is sort of the same way. There's the problems of the brain, the neurological disorders, mental illness, um, even pain are caused by defects in your wiring. And so when, if you, it's just as I'm saying, if the, your light bulb's gone out, you, you say, hey, that's a problem with the wiring or the problem with the electricity, or it's the fuse box or something. Well, it's the same with your brain. If you're depressed, if you have pain, if you forgot where you left your keys the other day, if you've got uh, some sort of brain injury, anxiety, all of that, whatever. anxiety, all of that's related to your wiring. And so the question is, well, what's wrong with my wiring? Now today, or before our technology, you're pretty much left on your own. You, we don't know. We can't. We don't understand people's wiring. So we have other ways of trying to figure it out. And science is very smart. Medi- doctors aren't dumb. They've figured out other ways of trying to understand what's wrong. And, you know, okay, you're feeling a little blue. Here's a pill you can take. Maybe it will work. 40% of the time, it won't work, right? It, there's a lot of, for antidepressants, there's a high failure rate. They just don't work for some people. And the reason is, it's a pill that's made for somebody in general, just general wiring problems. It's not made for your specific problem right. because your connectome is unique to you. Everybody's connectome is a little different. Everybody, every, the wiring, every building is a little different. And so what we do is we bring those wiring maps. We build those maps so that if you have pain or you forgot where you left your keys or you're feeling a little anxious or depressed or whatever, if you're suicidal, if it's that severe, we can map that and we can show where in your connectome, in your wiring, the problem lies. And so that's a complete transformation for everything we do about the human brain today when it comes to these problems. And, and trust me, these are, you know, mental illness alone, 20% of Americans will suffer from a diagnosable mental illness or anxiety disorder every single year. I mean, it's a, it's a huge number. Two billion people on earth every year have a, some sort of mental disorder. And so the, for us, the market is gigantic and the, and the difference we can start to make uh, is almost uh, limitless in terms of, you know, sort of dealing with this challenge that we're all in today, which is, you know, we just don't understand the brain. So that's what we do. And that's what we build. And these maps are quite um, really revolutionary. When we show them to even experts in the field, they say, I thought this was 20 years away. I, I and we say, no, we, we built it today. And so our job now, as you, as you suggest, Mike, is, is to now build these things so that they're useful, they're usable, they're practical, they're scalable, they're safe, you know, and that doctors uh, or whoever's going to use them can understand what, what it, we, we present useful information to those people. Because just showing you a map of your brain isn't necessarily useful. We've got to get 
we've got to get down to the level of, okay, how do I take action on this? And what does it mean? What does it mean for, you know, this person's mental health or, or the person that's in front of me I'm trying to treat? You've got the software and the AI uh, overlays to be able to generate these, uh, the, 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 these uh, actually, it's personalized medicine, really. Correct. Personalized, personalized brain medicine. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got these, so you've got these maps. Now, how, uh, the, 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 the products that you guys have built, Quicktome and the Infinitome, the Infinitome, it seems like that's more of a research-based uh, application versus the Quicktome is more, is more based in the therapeutic side. If I even step back a little bit more, there's two pieces to our kind of secret sauce, right? There's like, there's two underlying pieces to our technology. And the first is what we call a structural connectivity atlas or an SCA. And this just simplifies, it's an atlas of your brain networks and it, and it relates them to the structure of your brain. So that is a, it's a, it's, that's a basic map. I shouldn't say basic, a very sophisticated map, but that's sort of the, the bedrock of what we do. And that's very useful when you want to know where the network is. And so that's useful for brain surgeons because they really want to know where are the networks. So where's your motor network? Where's your vision system? Where is your, where are your higher cognitive networks? How do I make sure that I cut around those or I avoid those or I minimize damage to those when I'm removing a tumor, I'm cutting into somebody's brain. So that's what we call our SCA. And that's the core of that product called QuickTome, which we built for neurosurgeons. The second product or the second core technology we have is what we call a connectivity matrix. And so that takes your brain and it compares it against a normal brain, a healthy brain, to find if there's any, you know, any ghosts in the machine, anything that's not right. It, and, it, and one of the ways it, it expresses itself where we visualize it is like a QR code um, okay. it with the little, you know, little dots on it. It's a matrix that basically shows how well your networks are talking to each other. And if there's anything to be worried about there, if there's two networks that are talking too much or too little and neurological disorders are expressed by networks being too active or underactive. And so we can, map, we can map that with our connectivity matrix. Now, you take those two, two things together. So the basic map, and then we say, okay, how does your brain compare to somebody else's? Those two together are the platform that we built. And that now allows us to build tools for any neurological disorder, for everything from, 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 from brain tumors, for neurosurgeons, to uh, you know, dementia, for neurologists, to brain injury, to... Uh, traumatic, uh, you know, disorders like um, PTSD or autism, um, even down to things as simple as depression and anxiety disorders for for psychiatrists. So we can build tools for all of them. What we are doing now is trying to figure out, you know, how do we build each of those tools and what sequence, and how do we get it into market in the U.S. and around the world? So these t- these tools, that, these maps that you're building, these are kind of like the blueprints of what a normal functioning brain would look like that, that you can pair and contrast with. Yeah, exactly. With, 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 with a patient, let's say you, let's say you map my brain, let's say I'm having suicidal tendencies and you, you map my brain and then you'd overlay that to what a normal functioning brain would look like in that, uh, application. Correct. And you would see there's clusters that are forming that are firing incorrectly or firing too quickly or not quickly enough or whatever. And then, exactly. so, okay. And so you're there. It's really going to be. It's going to be templated out for each different application. Correct. So we can literally show where your suicidal tendencies are in your brain. Like we can show wow. the circuits that are misfiring. Now, the next point is well, okay. So so what? And so then the right. so what becomes very interesting because unlike your genome, and genomics has become a big industry as we all know, but your genome is pretty much unchangeable once you right. get. You, it's locked, right? It's very hard to change, dangerous, ethically suspect, very hard to change. You know, your connectome is very different. Your connectome is very, what's called plastic. It, it rewires itself. It can easily, relatively easily be rewired. Your brain is an amazing thing. And so the great news is that if we can find where your suicidal um, tendencies are within your brain, there are actually existing therapies that exist today and drugs that can target those specific um, circuits. And over time, we, we're, we're working with pharma to develop more therapies to specifically target individual brain circuits. So if you go to the doctor, let's go to the future a little bit, you, you might go to your GP and say, you know, doc, I'm feeling, uh, I'm depressed, I don't feel myself, I'm getting weird thoughts. And the first thing that doctor, your GP says is, 
let me send you for an omni test. Let's go, let's go get you scanned. So he sends you for a, right. a, 20 minute, a 20 minute MRI. He gets a scan back to his office. You can sit and talk with him. And then he can say, I can see here that you've got, it looks like you have some symptoms here that look like together they could be called depression. I'm going to send you off to see a psychiatrist to, to deal with this. You go into that, see that psychiatrist, they psychiatrist looks at it and goes, ah, absolutely. Um, I can see here's your suicidality. Here's your fear of uh, crowds. Here's your inability to sleep. Here's how, where you've lost your, your sex drive. We, we can find all those in your connectome. But that what that doctor might do is say, let's deal with your suicidal issues first, because that's most important. Yeah, <laughs> we can't fix anything else. Right. So well, here's some here's some treatments that can target your connectome to try to deal with your suicidality by regulating up or down those circuits. So we get you back on a more even keel. You're not trying to kill yourself anymore. And that can be the first thing it could be a pill. It could be some sort of a non-invasive treatment. And so that's the future that we're going to and that we're going to enable in our tools we can see being used by every one of those at every level right by the doctor that you see for your first point of care by the psychiatrist by the treatment center you go to by the pharmacy the company that builds the therapies or the drugs all of them using our tools to better target precision medicine to your brain and the circuits in your brain unbelievable so so if we go back 15 minutes ago where you said doctor you know, I'm having a depression, anxiety, and they're going to give you that drug and it's going to work 40% of the time, 60% of the time, whatever it is, because it's made for the general connectome. This is going to be targeted therapy that's specifically titrated or, or the therapy can be targeted or constructed specifically for your connectome or, or the area in your connectome where you're, it's not firing correctly. Exactly. Exactly. And Look, for some people, uh, just take depression, for example. Some people, um, you know, Prozac works really well, and it's a, it's relatively inexpensive. You know, it's you know, limited, rel, you know, relatively low side effects. Not bad. For for a lot of people, those pills don't work. And they can have, you know, they can have one antidepressant, then they go on another one, another one, and they find that none of them work. Or they need to take this one plus this one plus this one or whatever. And it can be very, they can, and they can have powerful side effects as well. Unfortunately, sometimes, and sometimes one of the side effects is, you know, the, the level of suicidality, the risk of you killing yourself actually goes up by taking these drugs or get or trying to cycle off them. And you have to cycle on or off and off them over time. Now, so there's always going to be a place for kind of probably the general pill. But I think what we're going to see now, particularly with our tools, is a, is a you know, over the next 10, 20 years is a shift now. To, to medicines that are more tailored to your individual connectome and to the specific problems that you're having in, with your circuitry. Not a general pill that just you know, goes after a general problem for a general population, it's, it's tailored to you. And we even see a future where you know, your brain health is no longer kind of just left to luck, which is kind of the way it works today, right? You just, hey, I hope I don't get Alzheimer's, I hope I don't get depressed, and if I do, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try to deal with it at the time. At the time. We see a future where you and your family will, you know, you'll like with your car, you take it in every year for a service. Well, you'll take your brain in every six to 12 months and your family's brains you, and you'll, you'll, you'll be on top of their, their connectome, any problems in the connectome, anything that's, that, that any biomarkers we're seeing that, that are a, a cause for concern for the future, you can start to get on top of anything that's um, going wrong in that connectome that, you know, you should be acting, actioning today. And, you know, here's a host of therapies that can, can help to deal with that. And that can be for everything from neurodegenerative diseases to, um, you know, to other neurological disorders, to things like depression and, and mental illness. So there's a real wide gamut that we see our technology enabling. And long term, we see a real shift in just how, you know, 30 years from now, I think our kids will look back and be amazed that, you know, hey, you, you don't get your brain scanned every six months and, you know, right. keep on top of your connectomic health. They'll, they'll seem like it's crazy. Um, just like 50 years ago, we all we smoked all the time, right? And thought that was healthy. Yeah. Or I was, you know, I was talking to uh, a guy that was working at our house the other day. He's got a pickup truck and we were putting some stuff in the pickup truck to move to a storage unit. And he had some stuff in the front seat. And I kind of jokingly said, oh, don't worry, I'll just jump in the back. And he goes, yeah, can you believe that we did that? We had, like, I used to ride in the back of my dad's truck, right? Yeah, I did that too. Yeah. You think about it, and you're like, I can't believe that we did that back then, or or that you know the pictures, the best are the pictures of the moms of the '50s that are pregnant, like holding a cigarette and a martini. And the in doctor's, one hand the and doctor's got a cigarette. Is in the 
It's, it's delivering the baby. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then also, if you take that a step further, you know, when these babies are born, they'll be able to have a blueprint. I mean, a, 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 a baseline, right? Like this right. is yeah. with how it was when they were born. And then at, at 18, when they became adults, this is your blueprint or your, or your baseline moving forward. And then any changes beyond that, you'll be able to measure and uh, project out seemingly what could go wrong. I mean, and the cost, I mean, the cost of, of mental illness and neurological disorders is crippling um, the U.S. economy. It's crippling economies around the world. The cost is enormous. And it's not just the treatment cost. It's the lost productivity of people who aren't working, sure. who can't work. It's actually estimated, it's about 10% of GDP is wasted on mental uh, health issues. And, and I'm, yeah. I shouldn't say wasted, is 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 held back and that's that's not evaporated yeah or, or uh, cost. Yeah. it's lost a human potential and so this there's we talk about the, the the total addressable market of what we address there's no bigger tam than the human brain it's the biggest tam of all and is the most important source of data in the world that we don't understand and so yeah we we're hopeful that our company you know small as we are today you know 10 20 30 years from now will be, you know, a major player in this new brain brain economy where, you know, people have much more control and much more precision about their brain health. And and these a lot of these issues that we're facing today that are really at epidemic proportions have been brought under control. And we think that our maps, our tools can be a big part of, of bringing that that epidemic under control. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I follow a lot of these different markets pretty closely. One of the um, one of the one that I've one of the ones I've been paying a lot of attention to as of lately is the psychedelics market. Yeah. This is having a huge renaissance now because what we're doing now doesn't work. Well, what, the, what psychedelics do, um, and the reason it's been renewed is there's one of your networks and it's one that we map is called the default mode network, the DMN. And the DMN is very, it's, it's essentially when you, it's it, the main function of the DMN is when you think to yourself, it's kind of like, it's your internal uh, yeah, your voice. It's your, sen- it's your sense of self. It's your inner voice. We we even sometimes joke. We say it's your soul, and and it's what it's a big part of what makes humans human. Okay. Now the DMN wasn't even known to science fifteen years ago. We didn't even know it existed. It was first kind of detected and mapped about ten years ago. We're the only group in the world that mapped that at scale today. So I can map your DMN in 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 less than an hour. We're the only wow. company, we're the only group in the world that can do that at scale. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the DMN, along with a couple of other networks, is related to every neurological disorder. It's it's faults in how the DMM is talking that causes every mental illness, every neurological disorder. And what psychedelics do, and we're working with some of those, uh, those, those psychedelics um, developers to try to help them understand how to better develop uh, more targeted psychedelic drugs, what, what the psychedelics have the promise of doing is is basically kicking your DMN back to a regular rhythm. If your DMN is getting out of rhythm, psychedelics can come in and kind of give it a jump start and get it back to the right rhythm. And when your DMN's out of rhythm, that's when you have a lot of mental illnesses. It's it's one of the biggest causes. So so psychedelics and ourselves kind of come together and that we're building the better maps for them to be able to to better build precision psychedelics. So you're not just taking anything again, you're taking something that's really customized to your connectome. That's the interesting piece about it. I follow. I don't know. You, you probably know the name Zappy Zappelin. Um, he's he's uh, pretty big in the in the psychedelic space. I follow him pretty closely. But he's, uh, you know, it's 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 a really interesting field because you you see a lot of crossover. You know, the, you, you, the syllabus asylum and the MDMA and the you know they all kind of talk that they address some of the similar things and some of them are interrelated. Some of them can treat depression and anxiety. Ketamine can treat this, you know, and then so you're trying to make sense of it, see where it's all going. Right. And, and it's tough because to, without a map. Well, the one thing they all lack, they all lack is, is the wiring maps that we build. And so yeah. it doesn't mean a drug can't work without our maps. It can still work, but we just bring the promise of a much more precise understanding of what's going on and how that particular drug is affecting the connectome. And so it yeah. becomes a, a much more um, exact, precise exercise. You're now making drugs and, and, and therapies that are much more targeted to individual connectomes. Because no matter how good a drug is, or in terms of uh, you know how well it treats a certain, um, uh, a certain issue in your brain, 
connectomes are heterogeneous. They're all different. And so you're going to get huge millions of people that that drug doesn't work for, even if it, right. it even if, even if you don't understand the connectomes, there's still millions of people that won't work for. I'll give you an example, treatment resistant depression. So if you're depressed in the U S you know, 20 million Americans, uh, uh, so 20% of Americans every year are, have some sort of mental illness or uh, anxiety disorder. Well, which is a crazy number in and of itself, but yeah, go ahead. It is. And, and so around 20, 30 million wind up in doctor's offices getting some sort of SSRI or antidepressant. Well, about 5 million of those fail two of those drugs. They, the two of those drugs don't work for them. So 5 million Americans every year fail, um, uh, antidepressants, two of them don't work for them. And that means they then become eligible for other treatments. And there's a treatment that's called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, which you might know about. It's, it's, it's safe. It's FDA approved, uh, non-invasive. Um, and it's been around for about 10 years or so, 10, 15 years. And what it does is it's a, it's a magnetic coil that basically takes, takes a magnetic beam and fires it into your brain. And what it does is it rewires different sections of your brain. Now, TMS has been around a long time. It's cleared in the U.S. for treatment-resistant depression, and it actually has very pretty good results. It's a it's got a pretty uh, about a forty percent remission rate with treatment-resistant depression patients who already failed lots of other drugs, and it gets paid for in the U.S. system. So most Medicare and most insurance companies will pay for uh, TMS treatment for somebody who's failed to other uh, depression treatments. Yeah, I think isn't that, isn't the company uh, Neuronetics? I think is one of the correct companies. Neuronetics. Yeah, and there's some great companies doing great work there. But one of the challenges they've got is, um, good as TMS is, it's still a beam, just I'm, I'm generalizing it, but the beam is targeted an area of your brain sort of this size. And the problem is they miss the target a lot of the time. So it still doesn't work because it can't see the target. And then and the maps they use are pretty pretty basic and pretty primitive. They literally will take a kind of cap and put it on your head and have a ruler on your head to try to find the spot they're going to try to hit, which is, you know, it's better than nothing. Well, what we do is we eliminate the ruler. We build a connectomic map of the brain. So we can then show down to this kind of level exactly the, the, the part of the connectome, the circuits that they need to hit. And so it's called we call it connectomic navigated TMS and or CNTMS. And so using our maps, we then take the efficacy rate from 40% to 80%. We can double it for many of these disorders. Wow. So it suddenly gets a lot better, which also means potentially fewer treatments, uh, the treat, the, 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 uh, the remission rates are lower. Um, so that the treatments last longer, you don't have to go for as many treatments, uh, which saves people money, saves people time and it works better. And so now we are working with a number of TMS clinics in the U S we've got about five different clusters across America where we're working with psychiatrists, TMS clinics, referring GPs, radiology centers to try to put together, um, what we call these connectomic uh, brain health centers where, yeah. you know, you, you imagine you're, you're going to get your brain scan, you'll find out what's wrong with it. And then over time, we're going to work with these therapeutics makers and clinicians to develop a whole range of therapies that are designed to address your connectome, TMS being one of them, but it could be just normal talk therapy. It could be meditation. It could be a, a pill that you take um, because that's, we think is going to be the future of brain medicine, not the kind of guesswork that we have today. That's amazing. So yeah, this thing, I mean, when you talk about this thing really getting big quick, it's it, it's a lot to digest because you've got all of this going on and you've got a, you, you've got, you're talking to psychiatrists, you're talking to clinics, you're talking to this. There's a whole side of the business that we, we haven't talked about. Is there um, a, the surgical side? What are the surgical implications of this? Is there, uh, have you guys even gone there yet? Is there, is there, can you, you can map this out and then does that give you a uh, better navigation inter intraoperatively or is it? it so, the so the first product we built and we took through the FDA last year, so it's FDA cleared, is called Quick Tone Surgical and and that is our, our our structural connectivity atlas side of our technology. It's the it's the it's the map of your brain, and so that's a tool now being used at being used at about uh, within a few months. We've got over sixty U.S. based hospitals that are trialing or or bought our software already, including guys like Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, uh, Stanford, UCLA, MD Anderson. Some of the biggest names in brain surgery and in medicine are already using our technology, and so what it does is it it allows a brain surgeon to, um, they'll send their patient for an MRI 
that's standard. That's that's standard what they do. That MRI, we we put a protocol on that MRI machine just to get a slightly different type of data. We pull that data up to the cloud. We pull that. We build our maps in less than an hour. We can then give that map to the doctor. So he's in his surgery, planning his surgery. He has a connectomic map of that person's brain where he's trying to understand where's the tumor, what has the tumor affected in terms of that person's brain networks, how, what's the, and what's the best path for me to take to get and remove that tumor? What's the right strategy here? Um, I want to, what he wants to do, or he or she wants to do is try to avoid the certain networks. It's called avoid the network and right. understand what the, it's called oncofunctional balance. It's the balance between getting the tumor out and causing damage to the brain while you're getting the tumor out. And so every brain surgeon needs to go through this uh, discussion with themselves and with their patient about, you know, there, there may be damage to your brain by the fact that I'm taking this tumor out, but if I leave the tumor in, you're going to die. So yeah. you got to think through the, the trade-off or you could die um, or you could have or that, that tumor is going to cause other problems other than paralysis or loss of speech or whatever. And so those doctors, they've got a, an amazingly tough job is to try to figure out, okay, what's the right strategy and the, and the route to go in to move that tumor. What we do is we provide them that map that helps them make a better decision about which way to go, how to avoid both the kind of more, what we call, I'd call the obvious networks around your motor and your speech and your sight. But we also add them less obvious, the, high, the harder to map networks that only we can map, which are higher cognitive networks. The DMN, which we mentioned before, the central executive network, the salience network. These are the, these are the higher cognitive networks that make you human and allow you to multifunction and, and perform at a higher level. Before we came along, these were unmappable by these doctors. They couldn't see them. So they were basically cutting right through them without even being able to see them. No clue. No clue. And now they can see them. And so it just gives them a much, much better tool that we think is going to become standard of care in neurosurgery over the next few years, where if you're not using our, our technology in neurosurgery, you're, you know, you're, you're not doing the right kind of surgery. You're, you're going in blind. And I've spent right. a lot of time with brain surgeons who I have an enormous amount of respect for. They take on the hardest job in medicine, which is really neurosurgery. But to date, the tools they've had, you know, sophisticated as they are, have, have seemed really primitive when right. you, look at the, the, you look at what we bring to the table. And so many of the doctors we're working with are just blown away by our technology. I mean, we, I literally, I could show you videos of doctors saying, well, when I first saw it, I thought this is impossible. Um, no this is too good to be true. No way. And then they start to use it. And even when they use it, they're skeptical. They're like, well, I'm, I'm still going to do the way I thought I'd do it. I don't trust your technology. But then they start to test our technology against what, the way they do it. And they go, your technology is right. I was wrong. And so now we got a lot of doctors changing their whole approach to surgery. They're starting to use our technology for not only for preoperative planning, but using for postoperative recovery. We've got brain yeah. surgeons now who are, who, are, who, are, who are getting really smart in how they're using it. They're saying, let me scan this patient before I perform surgery and let me figure out which networks are kind of under uh, that I'm going to have to cut through that are kind of be at risk. And, and then let me send that patient for some TMS therapy for a, a, a week or so to, to downregulate those networks because you can stimulate networks to go to kind of be less active and then you can stimulate others to be more active. Basically, what they're trying to do is to kind of, you know, you're going to paint a room of your house where you take the furniture out of that room, you put it in another room. They're trying to take the furniture out of the room and put wow. it in another part of the house. So we've got doctors now downregulating the networks. They'll then go in and do their surgery. They're trying to minimum. They're gonna. They're gonna have to affect that network, but they've kind of lessened its importance. They've unplugged the electricity to it to a certain extent before they went in. They take out the tumor. Then, in the post-op therapy, they scan them again with our tools, and then they upregulate the network um, to kind of bring that network back. And so they're trying to just minimize wow. the damage much more proactively now than they could do before. They couldn't do this before because they didn't. There was nothing to downregulate. Or upregulate because they couldn't see anything. They didn't have the map. So it's it's kind of just changing the whole way they're thinking about how they do brain surgery. And we're getting amazing uptake with that product around the world now. Just in a few short months, we've got over 300 uh, neurosurgical centers around the world that have said, uh, you know, we want this. So we're going through trials with all of them. And as I say, it's the, even the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, uh, Stanford, uh, UCLA, uh, you know, in New York, some of the biggest, uh, Mount Sinai, 
Mount Sinai. Yeah. It's kind of everywhere in the U.S. right now. And uh, it was starting to revolutionize how neurosurgery is done. We, we want to do the same for mental health and neurology and dementia and depression. So that's our longer roadmap. It seems like it would be easy. It's easy to uh, get up and, and be excited about it every day when you see the results being so promising. I would think you can't. You can't. You can't be more. I, I've never worked in the world of healthcare and medicine before. I was in big tech, right? And big tech. Right. I was at Facebook for years, and Facebook was move fast, break things. We're going to change the world, and you know, companies like Facebook, Google, not neurosurgery. And- <laughs> it's changed the world. Like, yeah. And, yeah. And we move fast and got stuff done. You come over to the world of medicine, it's both, it's like you, you feel like you're soaring with eagles one minute and then you're flying with turkeys the next, right? It's it's amazingly, there's highs and lows. And the highs are, you know, you're seeing the difference. You're, the, the, the tools that we make are changing lives every day. Like it, it, we actually have a, we have a measure of our business, which is called Lives Touched. And so we we measure how many lives has our technology tr- helped to improve or helped to you know, deal with their therapy or their, or, their, or their medical procedure. And now we're up to almost 2,000, just a few months, where we have products in America. We have up, up to about 2,000 people who've had our tools used in things like brain surgery. And we didn't even exist two years ago. And yet now brain surgeons are using our tools. So we're very heartened and you know, excited by that. But at the same time, we want to go to billions. Like we, we know we can build tools you know, 2 billion people every year suffer from a mental illness on the face of the earth. We can build tools for all of them to help help yeah. all of them. So that's our bigger goal. But at this, at the same time, uh, you know, that's flying with soaring with eagles, flying with turkeys is this frustration of the medical, the healthcare system. It's, it's not like Silicon Valley, right? It doesn't move fast. It's uh, the word innovation is, is frightening. It's about, you know, it, there's a lot of reasons why healthcare moves very slowly uh, that are very good. There's also reasons, some reasons that are kind of frustrating for us, but, you know, we're trying to move and be as clever as we can to get our tools into the right hands of the right people and to, you know, build at pace. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an impatient guy. I want to bring my tools to everybody on earth as quickly as possible. Right. So, you know, like you say, we get up every day, you know, we don't sleep. We work 24 hours a day. We just, we're on such a mission. Our mission is to to improve the lives of billions through this field of connectomics. And, you know, we've just, we're just scratching the surface today. Yeah, no, it's, it is, it's, it, it's frustrating. The scientific method, you know, by design is put in place to protect the patient. Um, but then it, you know, at, at points in time, sometimes it feels like it's, it, it inhibits the patient. Yeah. I won't tell you stories I hear. Sometimes I, I kind of pull my hair out. I'm like, I'm so frustrated by you know, we I, I, we have brain surgeons call us and say, "I've seen your technology. I've used your technology. I love your technology. Your technology is game changing. I need it in my practice." Um, I've been, but I've been pounding on a a wall inside my hospital for six months, and and nothing's happened. And yeah. I come from a world where you know, if you want to get Mike, if you want to get TikTok on your phone, literally, I can go to the app store while we're talking. I can just hit download now. And in 30 seconds, I'm watching funny videos on TikTok. Right. That's it's that easy. It's, you know, it's not hard as a consumer to just get technology on your phone like that. We can put our technology onto a, onto a doctor's, a neurosurgeon's or a doctor's device as quickly as you can get TikTok on your phone. Bang. Yep. But the problem is he can't use it in his hospital until it's got that hospital's approved all the legals and financials and IT. IT. All the, all the compliance stuff. And that can take a year. And so you spend a year watching funny videos on TikTok on your phone, but that brain surgeon still isn't using our tools for life-saving yeah. surgery because of the, the admin around it. There's good reason for that. It's about you know, not moving too fast. It's for, you know, preserving, you know, making sure that you don't do things that are dangerous for patients. We're very cutting edge. We, we have FDA clearances, but a lot of people don't understand what we do. They don't understand connectomics. Even... Um, even brain surgeons, um, you know, as smart as they are, connectomics is a new field for them. The idea of using machine learning to map the brain is kind of a new idea for them. Many of the networks we map for them, they they never studied in med school, um, and so we've got a uh, we've got a big education job ahead of us as well to to help people understand what connectomics is and what it can do. Yeah, when you're bringing that big something that's that radically different, it's f- physicians by and large. It's funny that those physicians that you mentioned that would would kind of go against what the science what, what the what the mapping said they would 
cut where they normally would cut and then they would realize that, oh, I probably should have paid attention to that. They're pessimistic by nature. So, uh, because they're, they have to be, because they're looking, you know, they're, they're, you have to be, they're in the best interest of, they're doing what they think is in the best interest of their patient. And, and so they have to be, you know, constantly looking around each corner of what could go wrong or what, what could be bad with this. But um, medicine is, is cautious. I should note though, that the science of connectomics is well established. There's over a hundred thousand peer review papers uh, on connectomics. In fact, of all the omics in the world, genomics, biomics, um, connectomics, the second most papers that peer review papers that have been published is in the field of connectomics. Only genomics has more. And so it's the science of what we do is very well established. It's the application. But it's the application. And in a way, connectomics has emerged so quickly because it's based on data, right? It's based on machine learning and data. It's emerged so quickly that your average brain surgeon, let's say they're 40 years old and they're, you know, at a, you know, at a, at a very reputable uh, hospital in the U.S., they've never heard of connectomics because when they went to med school and they did their- wasn't taught, training, yeah. Wasn't taught, didn't exist. Um, it wasn't part of the canon of how they learn. And suddenly, you know, you know, guys like me have come along and said, ah, well, we built this whole new thing that looks at the brain in a completely different way. And- it's not that they're not receptive to it. They're just like, well, it's going to take me a while to get my head around this, so to speak, because right. it's such an advanced way of thinking about the brain. Um, but that said, I've got to say, we've got some amazing advocates for our technology. Some of the leading brain surgeons in the world have stepped in and said, what you guys are doing is amazing. And I want to be part of this. And I, that's what I love about it's, it's what I love about medicine, actually, is um, doctors, um, they have a higher purpose and the higher purpose is yeah. the good is the good of humankind. And, you know, I come from a world in Silicon Valley where, you know, we were building for the world, but hey, we were competing as well, right? Facebook doesn't go over to Google and tell them their secrets, right? Whereas in medicine, uh, you know, brain surgeons, they come together all the time and they, t and they share each other's best practices, their secrets, what works well, what they failed at, what they're doing good at. They, they, they share things that in normal professions and normal business, you would never share with your competitors. And so that's one of the beautiful things about about medicine is just how, you know, how open and how devoted to a higher ideal uh, every doctor in the world seems to be. It's it's something that really humbles me, and I feel you know lucky to be part of this this new world. Yeah, no, it, it, you guys are. I mean, you're you're on the right track, though. I mean, I I, I know you have. Uh, I've I've looked at the sales team that you you guys have assembled here in the U.S. and you've got some really really intelligent folks, and you you go about it the right way. There's no market in medicine that's more data driven than neurosurgery. And, but the, there's that, the, you know, that that's, the, it's bad when you don't, when you don't have those people in your corner, that's bad. But once you start getting the key people that, that are the key, key opinion leaders, the thought leaders, the people that maybe a lot of these folks out there studied under, um, they, you know, once they start using it, and they start speaking about it on the podium, and they start uh, writing papers about it, publishing, et cetera. It it, it can happen very quickly. Uh, something like, and especially if it's if, if it's making the kind of impact that it, that you guys are, um, it, it can catch on like wildfire. To your point, it's not always it, the challenge. Really, isn't always just getting the physician on board. It's it, it, it you know that's that's oftentimes that's the, easy, that's, that the, the small part. that's the small part of it yeah yeah it's getting it into the system and, and and making them understand how what a sense of urgency they need to have around it i want to be sensitive to the to, to the amount of time we have with you here today um this is this has been absolutely fascinating uh i i, I would say last question what, what what do you guys have coming any any new products or is it just more applications of connectomic the the, the, the mapping of connectomics uh, in different indi indications or? So the really exciting thing about what, uh, where we're at as a company right now is we started by building quick tone surgical, which is, um, you know, you, you got to start somewhere, right? We, we could have built, right. uh, you know, it's like, oh, we can build hundreds of different products. Okay. Well, which one are we going to build? And we decided to build the first one was quick tone surgical, which we took through the FDA, which is used by brain surgeons. And we're pushing into hundreds and hundreds of, of neurosurgical hospitals around the world. Now, that is kind of our beachhead into hospitals, right? So hospitals are where 
roughly 50% of healthcare is delivered, other 50% is delivered outside of, of hospitals. So that gets us in the hospitals, gets us over the IT legal um, firewalls and gets us you know, embedded at the top of, 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 of those hospitals, both economically and kind of almost intellectually. You know, brain surgery makes money for most U.S. hospitals. It's highly profitable. And we help right. that we help that surgery, that, that, sur- that brain surgery practice, be more effective and essentially be more profitable. It, it's better at what it does. And so that gets us Well, and it's of, something that they can advertise. I mean, this is, there, there's marketability to that. We've got hospitals already advertising that they use our technology. We didn't even know they were doing it. We just, somebody just sent us the ad. Like, yeah, it's just like a robot. Exactly. And so, so that gets us in the door. Well, that's great. And that's a very important market for us, a very important tool. And, you know, we want to, you know, we want to be in every neurosurgical center around the world over the next few years. But that's probably the smallest market for us of all the markets we can go after. We talked a lot about other things, you know, things like mental health and and, and neurological disorders, stroke. I mean, there's much bigger markets than neurosurgery and uh, many more people are affected by them. And so now we're building tools for all of those other areas. And we've got a, a strategy. I won't go into the details, but with the FDA to essentially we've gotten half of our platform through the FDA already. We're taking the other half through this year. And so once we've done that, we now have a, we now have a platform that we can pretty, pretty much put any product in. Think of an app store for, for brain apps for doctors. So any doctor that deals with the brain in any way, be it I'm dealing with your pain or your, or or your dementia, your cognitive decline, your PTSD, your Parkinson's, your epilepsy, your, your depression, doesn't matter. We're building tools for those doctors to essentially sits in a, in, on the same platform. And so the, the, the neurosurgeons over here using what he uses to do his neurosurgery, the, the neurologist is here using what he needs for, for dementia. The, the psychiatrist is over here using what he needs for treating mental illness. And so we're starting to bring all of those products into that platform over the next few years. And our real challenge is just, it's just probably of all the things we've got to challenge us, the biggest one is shifting how doctors do their medicine. And we've seen with neurosurgery, as I've explained, the, they, you know, there's a skepticism. Hey, I've done it this way for a long time. I never learned this in, in med school. And that, yet we're bringing new tools to them that, that make them even better at being great neurosurgeons. Well, now we're going to do the same with other uh, doctors. And some of those, like psychiatrists, will never look at a brain scan. Right? They, they, a, a brain surgeon will. A psychiatrist won't because it won't tell them anything. And we're going to go to them and say, well, no. Looking at a brain scan, looking at our scan is going to tell you everything that you need to know about this, this, this person's brain. Now, that's such a revolution in psychiatry that it's, uh, and if we go to psychiatrists, they will say, I, 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 I know that's coming, but I thought it was 20 or 30 years away. And then we show them what we built and they say, oh my gosh, it's here today. But we, we're so advanced that th- that field doesn't know how to use our tools. So we have a real, right. our biggest challenge is really bringing the field with us. And that is a, you know, that's a massive, you know, battleship. That undertaking. Got yeah. In another direction. Big undertaking. Yeah. You've got, it's a, uh, it's a full, full education. It is. So we're, we're finding the early adopters, the innovators that, you know, that are leaning into this space already. We're working with them and then we're building the clinical evidence. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to very smartly find the right indications to build for where it can get reimbursed through the existing medical system, because that's going to be a little, um, that can be a blocker for you if you can't get reimbursed. So there's a lot of, um, you know, medicines are you, a Rubik's cube that you have yeah. to get every side matching up. Uh, and, uh, I've learned that I left Silicon Valley where we had our own challenges, but now I'm in the world of medicine where, you know, healthcare is, it's, uh, presents its own challenges, but the, but the rewards are, are vast. If we can help millions and billions of people with these issues and help transform the world. And then when that, that history of the century gets written and there's a chapter on connectomics, Maybe there's a little piece on us, a few paragraphs about our company in there about how we helped lead that revolution. Yeah, how you brought it to the forefront. No, it's I mean it's it's a beyond admirable cause. It's um, it's like I said in, in the beginning, it's a it's a underserved market. Uh, the neuro in general has been underserved, uh, not for a lack of effort. It's just uh, they didn't have the tools to be able to understand it. Uh, you know, there was a lot of money that's been thrown at this a, 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 along the way. No, it's it, that's phenomenal. Listen, I, uh, I, I at the end of every show, I like to give the guest an opportunity. If um, if there's people, I mean, I, this is this is going to be a, a big episode for us. I know there's going to be people that are going to go. I want to be a part of that. 
or there's going to be people that say uh, there might be physicians that are watching that say, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to get involved in this. What, um, what's the best call to action for people? Uh, should they be j- jump online, uh, reach out to you, reach out to uh, yep. human resources? What's the best way for people to, uh, you know, uh, to get in touch? Just hop on our website. You'll find a, uh, you know, contact us here that, that comes, that, that all winds up, you know, in, in my inbox. So I see all that. So please do that. The other way to do it is, you know, if you, uh, if you know anybody else in this space that you think we should be talking to, and it can be somebody, uh, you know, who's a researcher, somebody who's a, a doctor, somebody who's a, a, a sufferer, we're, we're always excited to be connected. We, we are not in a position to help everybody today or necessarily connect everybody up, but over the next few years, we're hoping that we can be so that literally, you know, we have a, a path for everybody who wants to come and work with us. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more excited about the work we're doing in the U.S. Our, our presence in the U.S. is pretty, is relatively big, but over the next couple of years, we're going to have a much bigger presence in the U.S. And I'm hoping to put a, a clinic in, uh, probably in California, where we will be using our brain mapping tools to, uh, to treat all kinds of disorders. And that's going to be a kind of showcase. We don't want to open up thousands of clinics. But we think that we need a kind of showcase where we can showcase what our technology can do for, uh, you know, for doctors around the world. And we, we think you kind of like a Tesla, uh, a flagship Tesla store where they have, so you don't have time. dealerships all over the country, but you got one here, one there. You can walk in, sit exactly. in it. Ultimately, our job is to work with the, you know, the thousands and millions of doctors on the, on the face of the earth today, the thousands of hospitals. But we think that we could use our own showroom in the U.S. and we've got a kind of prototype for how that would work. So. Watch this space. Hopefully within the next 12 to 18 months, we'll have something on our website. And that's a place that you can literally go, if, if particularly if you want to get treatment or if you want to co-develop some technology with us. We, we're, we're interested in anybody who's looking at the brain and where we can our maps could help make a difference. We can work together. That's fantastic. Well, I, I, I look forward to uh, hopefully it'll be L.A. and I'd love to love to come get my brain mapped. Thank you again, Stephen. I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, this is a fascinating field, one that I know uh, the listeners are going to be looking forward to watching move forward. You guys obviously are going to play a big part in that and uh, wishing you guys nothing but con- continued success. And uh, we'll be cheering from you guys for, for you guys from the sidelines. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here and uh, uh, good luck over the, with this new podcast. I hope it goes well. Fantastic. Thank you. Once again, Stephen Sheeler, CEO of Omniscient Neurotechnologies. Thanks for joining.